Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so just to let you know where today's class is going, we've got a new handout. Um, it actually continues on from last handout. And if anyone wants a copy of last handout, I'll leave them up here for you. Um, but what I've done is at the top of this new one for today, class 6A, um, I've, I've actually repeated the equations that we had from last class. Okay, so remember last class we derived the Newton's method as a way to solve the unconstrained single variable optimization. So the picture that you have in your mind is we've got some function f of x and a single search variable x. This is our degree of freedom. Okay, so for some particular situations in engineering, we have just a single search variable. Um, I'll give you a few examples in today's class. And this function f of x, I'll just try to re redraw this one that's up here on the board, um, might have that shape. Now, we derived in last class how we can approximate this function f of x by some polynomial p of x. Okay, and I'm not going to rewrite that formula over there, but essentially, we know that f of x is not, not necessarily a polynomial, but if we approximate it by a polynomial Taylor series in this form, f of x k, that's sort of like if you're seeing this in, t in, um, in your usual quadratic formula of ax squared plus bx plus c, this would be your constant c. Because x k is just a single known value, x k, um, if this is your first iteration, that would be x zero. If this was a later iteration, it's the x kth iteration, so it's a constant x value. Evaluate that function f of x at that point. Plus a linear term. So that, that next term there is a linear term, f dash of x k multiplied by x minus x k. And then plus your quadratic term. What we said last class is that a necessary condition for an optimum is that f of x has its first derivative 0 at the optimum. So here's f dash of x at that particular point at the optimum. So here's x star. So at the optimum, x star, the first derivative is equal to 0. So what we can do then is convert our optimization problem to actually what we called a root finding problem in 3e. So in 3e, um, you solved regularly the sort of idea that g of x equals 0, right? And so if we write then, instead of uh, g of x, just write f dash of x equals 0 and can solve that equation, we've actually found our optimum and we're done. So we derived Newton's method as a, as a way to do that last time. And, and over there um, is the, are the steps we set this polynomial approximation now. The first derivative of that we set to 0 instead. And what we derived in the class last time then is that xk plus 1 minus xk. That's, in other words, your step that you're going to take from one iteration to the next. You're going to start with some initial guess and then move along. This is the deviation by how much you move. We'll call this delta. That change that you make then you can see from that equation is equal to the negative of the first derivative of f over the second derivative of x. Okay, so that's what's the formula we ended up with in class last, last week. But what I wanted to do is just um, look at it geometrically, right? So that was a pure algebraic derivation, but there is a, a useful geometric derivation that you can have in your mind, and that's what we'll look at next here on the bottom half of this handout. Now, unfortunately, uh, when I was drawing this picture this morning, I, I forgot our notation was x superscript k, and I was using n's here. So uh, please either change the picture or just Make, you, uh, make note of that comment there that I had meant for that to be xk. So what I wanted to just show you here then is if we take this function f dash f of x, this is the function I'm trying to find the minimum for, I can draw below it here the first derivative of it. So we've got a negative slope, fairly constant. It's over there, that black piece. And as we move along, that slope 
becomes less and less negative, and at the optimum, that slope is zero. Okay, so this dashed line here is essentially the zero point on this vertical axis. So that's the point actually I'm really interested in finding, is that where that line crosses zero. Okay, I'll just keep finding the derivative of this function. The, the slope goes up, this curve goes up, and that's, that's why this curve has that shape. Now, for convenience, I'm going to just call f dash of x g of x, just for a bit of shorthand over here. So essentially, this new black curve over here, this windy black curve, is my g of x function. And my goal is to find where g of x equals 0. So if I'm at my current iteration, xn, the y value at that location on the g of x curve is g of xn. And one, the strategy behind Newton's method is uh, if you're standing at this point and you want to find where it crosses 0, draw the tangent. And you will basically go along the tangent. And where the tangent crosses 0, that's going to be your next guess. And then we'll go up there. We'll draw another tangent, come back down. And where that tangent crosses 0 will be our second iteration. And then we'll quickly narrow in on that 0. Okay, So let's just look at the construction at this nth iteration, or the kth iteration as I had intended. Um, so if we draw that tangent at that line, the tangent equation, we know that the tangent is g dash of x. But here's, here's the insight in this method, the geometric insight, I should say, is that that g dash of x, that tangent, it's a slope, right? So a slope is a change in y over a change in x. That's the definition of a slope. Well, what I can do is I can just pick these two points. And I very carefully choose the second point to be where it crosses 0. Okay? The, f the first point I pick is where I currently am with my iteration xk or xn here. So change in y over change in x, what is the change in y between these two points? Well, this point is where that tangent crosses the 0 line. So the y value there is 0 minus the y value at this current point is g of xn. Okay. And then the change in x is simple. I'm going to call that xn plus 1 because that's where my next iteration is going to be starting at and my current point xn. Okay, so let's be more correct though. Up here on the board is a small mistake. This isn't just g of x. This is g of x at the nth location. It's the slope of that g curve, that red line, at that location. Any, at another point, that slope has a different angle. So at that location, xn, I can approximate or write that slope exactly like that. OK, and then now you see where this is going. I you I'd imagine um, we can rearrange this a little bit. We can write this then as xn plus 1 minus xn is equal to minus g of xn over g dash of xn. OK, and then let's just uh, put in back our original variables. g of x was actually minus f dash of x. Right? I defined g of x to be the first derivative of f, so I can just go put that back in again. And then the second derivative of g would just be the second derivative of f. OK, so that's Newton's method then from a geometric perspective, as just moving along a tangent until you cross 0, repeat your iteration. Okay, So maybe then take a minute, if you've got that understanding in your mind, take a minute then and add to this drawing here what the second iteration's slope would look like and where it would cross the line g of x equals 0. To make sure, and verify it with the person next to you to make sure you've got the correct understanding.
I, this is really an important feature to understand because we're going to take this to two dimensions, three dimensions coming up. So this is the simplest case of it. Which? Oh, oh, sorry. So because for the next one, your y2 would be less than your y1. It yeah, it doesn't matter. You're go, you can, you'll flip around it, yeah. OK, so what you should then find is that your next iteration, you're at xn plus 1. And I'll just illustrate it here with a marker. Your tangent line will go something like that at that xn location and cross over there. And that will be xn plus 2. Okay, So then xn plus 2, if you want to keep going with this idea, you drop down, find that tangent line. That tangent line will pretty much go at that angle, and you might be right at the optimum within two or three iterations here in this particular example. Okay, So make sure you can understand how Newton's method is working geometrically. Now Newton's method has a bit of a shortcoming, right? Here this function has this nice smooth shape, but you can imagine, just uh, watch my hand here for a minute, take a look here at that second iteration. What if that slope was a little bit more this way? Right, so it's currently like this, but what if it was actually like this? Then on that second iteration, it's going to send you way back over there. And then it might send you back here and there and back again. So Newton's method has an unfortunate problem is sometimes it will go too far and you'll actually diverge rather than converge. Okay? And that's because what we've done here in this fairly straightforward implementation of the algorithm is that this delta, that step that we've taken, that delta, We've basically taken a full size delta step. But there's nothing that says you have to take a full delta. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to replace that with some fraction of delta. So maybe take half the Newton step right? and be less aggressive. Newton says to take a full step of this amount. We don't have to do that. We're going to see this idea coming up towards the end of this class and in future classes. Right? So so that's the, the unit step, but we could take a slightly smaller amount. Now, over the page, then, I, I want to take this another, another um, step further and have you think about the situation where we don't know the function that explicitly in a form that you can take the first derivative or the second derivative. Right? And here I give you, this is a realistic example, Let's say you're going to Aspen and you're trying to find the optimum area of a heat exchanger. So your function then is f of a. You're varying the area of the heat exchanger to find the optimum. Well, as you go to larger areas, you get more heat recovery, so you save utility costs, so you, there's some money being saved there. But a larger area is costing you capital, so that goes up. So you'd know then from 4n, let's, you can quantify this using an NPV. You can select a time horizon of maybe 10 years or, or whatever the period is that you're looking at amortizing this over. And then take all your cash flow savings and then this cost of the heat exchanger up front. Right? And that's a nonlinear function right there. The cash flows, there's depreciations in it if you did a, f a proper NPV analysis. Um, your cost estimate for the heat exchange is also nonlinear. We're comfortable with this format from 4n, that there's going to be some sort of power of a in there. You're going to have a power of a to the 0.7. So a nonlinear function shows up there. And once you sub all of these things into that NPV formula, you're definitely n not going to be wanting to take the first and second derivative of it. Right? You can maybe put this into MATLAB 
or into Mathematica or R and let it do it symbolically for you, but even that's messy, right? So is there an easier way that we can work with this? Well, we've, we've learned about finite differences in 3E, right? And so we're going to use those here now to make this problem a whole lot simpler. So this is a, a real example, but there are many instances that you can think of where you don't know the function. You know that you can find the value of it. For a given input, you can find the output, but you don't necessarily know what that function is. Right? We don't care to go really figure out what this messy, messy nonlinear f of a looks like. And we especially don't want to find the first and second derivative of it. But if we can go find an approximation to the first derivative using the central difference formula. So this formula should jump out of the page as something that you've seen before. That's the central difference. Remember, there's the forward difference and the backward difference. We could have used those, but why don't we? Dr. Adams would be happy to know that you know that we use this because there's less error in here, right? The central difference has a, less, a lower error approximation to the function than either the forward or the backward difference. Same here for the central difference approximation for f dash of x. Now, I just want you to actually look at what we're asking ourselves to do here. Right? We're going to go in and use our approximations here for f dash of x. So I'm going to approximate this, and I'm going to approximate the denominator. But I don't want to do so much work, right? I want to do as little as I can. And this formula here helps us do that. We only have to go evaluate f at our base case plus a small perturbation, and f at our current value of x minus a small perturbation. And the central difference formula for the second derivative requires that same value of f. So we don't need to go repeat the simulation in Aspen for this situation again. We use that same value of f. So again, we can reuse our Aspen result from the prior time. We only need to calculate f at the current base case, which we've probably done already, right? So geometrically, then, if you're looking at this, let's always try to get a picture in our mind, at least for the univariate cases. We've got this heat exchanger area that we're searching for. There's this unknown function, but let's say it might be something like that. So f of a. And at our current location, we're at this particular point. We're guessing that my optimum is at that location. I'm just going to put, make a small perturbation down and a small perturbation up. And I'm going to use those three function evaluations. f at x, or a I should say in this particular example if we're calling it area a. f plus a small perturbation up and f plus a small perturbation down. So only three function or evaluations, three Aspen simulations required. And you're back to where you were, back to regular Newton's method. Okay? So what I've done here then is given that for you. Let's take a look. I've got the algorithm, whether you know the function f of x, here is regular Newton's method, or in this particular, the second column here, or the third column I should say, is when you don't know the function value. You can evaluate it, but you don't know what f of x looks like. And all you notice is that the first two steps are different, but steps two and three are identical. So let's work through the regular algorithm. Right, so many of you did this on Friday for the assignment in the computer lab. With the regular Newton's method, you start with an initial guess, you select a tolerance, and you let your index k be 0. Calculate those derivatives at x naught, because k is 0, f of xk, and f second derivative at xk. We know we're at the optimum. We might be lucky on our initial guess, doubtful, but if we are at our optimum, th this is a little bit messy and might want to just clean this up in your printout. It, that says f dash of xk the absolute value. So I apologize, this uh, equation editor doesn't space broadly enough. Um, so it says, find the absolute value of f first derivative xk and make sure that that's within some epsilon. Does it 
Oh, okay. It just must be my um, my PDF then up here. So the reason for that is is why? Why is that our stopping criteria? Joseph. Right, for, but for the first derivative, right? It's clear that we're aiming to solve the first derivative equal to zero. And as you said, we're unlikely to hit it exactly zero. So as long as we're within some small amount, epsilon. And this is why epsilon is never specified generically, right? I can't tell you to use a value of 1 e to the minus 10 here. Because it's going to depend on the magnitude of your function, f. If you're trying to optimize costs, for example, in this Aspen case of the heat exchanger, you might be quite comfortable that that's accurate within 10, 15, maybe $1,000. Right? You want it to be close and small within that small range. That would be an excessive example, perhaps, but you would use your judgment for what you consider small. So there's no gen general rule for what is considered small. It's up to your, your guess over there. If you are within the bounds that you're willing to accept, you stop your algorithm over there. If not, then you do what's following. Take the full Newton step, delta x, and then set your counters one up, k is k plus one, your prior x, your next x becomes your prior x plus your, your step size, and you repeat again. Okay, so all that's different than in the, the Newton's, the quasi-Newton method where you're approximating your derivatives is that you simply use your approximations, and you have to select an h value. Again, that's your judgment. In the heat exchanger example, I've given you a value there of, let's say your base case currently is 750 meters squared. Your delta h could be a small amount up and a small amount down by 2 meters squared, 5 meters squared. Um, you would certainly not change your heat exchanger, say, from 750 to 750.1, right? That's probably not going to change too much in your Aspen simulation. But um, use, use reasonable values. OK, any questions on that portion there so far? No? OK, so this is, this is straightforward. Now, what, what I'd like you to try and answer is, what do you think are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this Newton's approach? Maybe talk, talk with the person next to you. When would this Newton's method not work so well? And when does it work really well? Under which situations? The prior example I showed? Yeah. No, it would just run it two extra times because yeah. the regular Newton's method would evaluate f of x anyway. Which isn't that big of a difference. No, but it, notice you're not requiring to know the first or uh, second derivative. The other method requires you to find f dash of x and f double dash of x analytically. Here you're finding it in an approximation. OK, so any shortcomings that people might suggest? When, when would you be <coughs> less, less reluctant to use Newton's method? Or when would Newton's method actually not work for you at all? Chris? We have to compute the first and second derivatives. Okay, so derivatives must be computable. Derivative. 
whether they're, you're computing it analytically, as in this uh, regular Newton's method, you can evaluate f dash of x and f second derivative analytically, or as in the quasi-Newton's method, you must at least be able to approximate them. Right? So if you can't do either of those, um, that this method won't work. Let's maybe expand on that. What would give an actual example of a function where that is not possible, where you cannot compute the first derivative or second derivative? Okay, so you just have values of the function output. Can you approximate the derivatives with that situation? Yeah, it'll be an approximation. It's an approximation. So what might be cases even where you can't e even really approximate derivatives fairly? Like multivariable? Like multivariable. Uh, we, you can approximate with multivariable. That's the next topic. So we're going, we, you definitely can. Yeah, if you've got two x's, you can still approximate it. It's now just not a line. It's now a, a plane. Right. Five. five, it's a plane in five dimensions. <laughs> Shows it. Anything where there's a discontinuity or maybe, I don't remember what it's called, where it has a big cycle, so the derivative at that point is not going to Okay, so anything that's got like a discontinuity or a spike, right? So a function that might look like this, right? That derivative is undefined after that point. The other far more, I mean, this doesn't happen a lot in engineering systems, but what does happen far more readily is that you're working on a system, and this might be temperature, and you get that happening, right? You've gone from liquid to vapor, right? Your material starts to boil, right? So there's a discontinuity there in the system. That happens far, far more readily in, in practical chemical engineering situations. So there, the derivatives wouldn't exist um, around that location. Okay. Other, uh, other negatives that you could think of? If your function happens to have like two minimums, you okay. start Multiple minima. Um, it will find one of them, right? So it will find one. The other problem is that if your function has both minimum and maximum, it will search for one or the other, right? Your goal might be to minimize the function, but if your function, let's say your function f of x, does this, it has a minimum and a maximum. What is the first derivative at that peak at the maximum there? Zero, zero. OK. And over here, zero. still 0. OK, so if you plot it, this is f of x. If you plot it, the second derivative, whoops, the first derivative of f, it would cross 0 twice. But you, if your goal is to minimize this function, you can't tell Newton's method to only give you that answer and ignore that one, right? The algorithm is blindly just following a sequence of steps and will give you one or the other, and it might not be the one you're intending. Wouldn't it be relatively easy to design in or to write in a check for that? Like if x, like the value of x is less than, you know, x plus some amount, right? And right, so you'd add a constraint. Yeah, so we're still looking currently at unconstrained problems, but absolutely, yeah, then you could add a constraint. Um, you can't necessarily really draw the function ahead of time, right? So we're assuming this is all being done by a computer and it, you don't have a visual for this f of x, right? So multiple minima, multiple maxima, it will find one and, and probably not the one that you're hoping for. And the other con is it, it generally requires a good initial guess. So like we saw in the prior example, if you're too far away, it might actually just diverge and not find that, um, that first derivative equal to 0. The pros are, um, yeah. yes, sorry, Mark. You need a good uh, initial guess. Yeah. 
that's a, it's a negative that you require a fairly good initial guess, right? Now the, neg the, the positives are that it's extremely fast. We've, uh, we've seen that in, in examples. In the assignment, you will show to yourself that you'll converge really quickly. Okay, and then the other thing is you just need a single point and not a bound. This doesn't seem like a positive just yet, but we'll come to methods where you're constantly moving your lower bound and upper bound closer and closer to bracket the optimum. The Newton's method is just moving a single point around and finding the optimum. But so this idea of, of bounds will become clearer in the next section. Yeah. I'm just curious, if you have a function that has a, a maximum but no minimum, like let's say there's no minimum to your function, right. how would you know that this method fails or that that was the case? Like, how would there be any way to distinguish that? Are you just looking at the step size or like the number of steps? OK, so if you had a function that just had a maximum like that and your goal was to find the maximum, it would, it would as long as you, I mean, if you're oh. trying to find the minimum of it, so if you don't have no idea what it is, oh. it turns out that it has no minimum, right. wouldn't it just run forever? Right, so it would run forever to negative infinity or plus infinity if it was unconstrained. Or it would land up against one of your constraints later on when we add constraints right. in. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, so I, I do want you to be thinking about these unusual situations because this will, most times, is what, what ends up happening in your computer solutions. So, so that's. Keep, keep going with that line of thoughts. OK, so what I've then left you here with is a challenge for yourself as a way to also start thinking towards the projects that you're going to be doing in this course. Right? You could be doing a project on linear programming, nonlinear programming, unconstrained, constrained. Here's a suggestion maybe to start looking at this. Can you find, for example, the optimal KC in a PI controller? What would your objective function be? Right? Your objective function would be a nonlinear function. You don't necessarily, um, you can't necessarily, I should say, take the first derivative of it or the second derivative of it. But can you find, using Newton's method, the, the quasi-Newton's method, an approximation to get you closer to that optimum? Okay? So uh, maybe start playing around with some of these ideas in your head. It doesn't need to be process control. It could be Aspen. It could be fa uh, fairly complex. But just to start putting some thoughts together about that. OK, so now I'd like to look at the idea of going to more than one dimension. So Mark had said, well, what about two or three variables or four, five variables? This is going to be our, our more regular case, is the multivariate. But we're still going to keep it unconstrained. So more than one dimension, but multivariate. And here's a motivating example to illustrate the situation. Um, in 4C, we don't look at nonlinear regression. But you can take what you've learned in 4C, those of you that have done it, um, and extend it to this case and see where, how this problem naturally arises. So what we've got here is a set of data of temperature and, and pressure, vapor pressure, P0. And we would like to find the constants A, B, and C that will, in that equation up there, best fit the data. So we don't want to, we're not doing what you've probably done in the past, is you've tried to play around with that equation and get it in a linear form, and then just use regular least squares. We're beyond that. What we're trying to do is say, just leave the equation as is, and find for me directly the values of a, b, and c that minimize the sum of squares of the errors so let's take a look there. That's my original form of the equation. If I take exponents on the left and the right, I get P0 is the exponent of all the terms on the right. And then if I subtract P0 minus that, this term should be 0 if A, B, and C fit the data perfectly. So essentially, you're taking the sum of squares of that equation, and you're trying to minimize it. And your three search variables, three degrees of freedom, are A, B, and C. You're going to keep moving A, B, and C around so that it best fits the data. When it's done here, um, here you, I'm just showing you the final outcome of the problem. A, B, and C are these three values. 
if we plot that line with those three coefficients substituted in, it fits the data quite nicely there for us. Okay, so that's our goal. Unconstrained, we don't put bounds on what A, B, and C are. As you can see, some are negative, some are positive. Unconstrained multivariable optimization. But again, let's not just do this purely geometrically. Let's have a picture in our mind for what's going on here. So I'll just show you a generic diagram. This is not for this ABC example. This is for, um, for an arbitrary example where we're trying to find a minimum here. So I'll just blow this up a little bit to uh, talk about it here. We will see this coming up over the next few weeks in the course where we draw contour plots for the function. So the green lines are contours of f. So f is a function of x1 and a function of x2 in this particular example. And using uh, computer software, you can find contour plots for that function. Now, just to be concrete, again, for those, you know, this is probably obvious here on the board what's, what's happening and where that minimum lies. But just want to emphasize what a contour plot is. A contour plot in this particular example is where f of x1, f of x2 is some constant. Okay, so you choose a constant, let's say maybe 100, and you sub that in, and if that's the green line related with that point 100, all the points along that dashed green line lie on that arc. Okay, and then this might be f with the contour 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, and our goal is to find that minimum over there. Now, the reason why we like to do this geometrically is because you can quickly, as you would well imagine, see this as a geographic map. You've all pro likely seen these plots in, um, at least on Google Maps or in high school geography classes where this is a, a contour representation of a mountain. So you can either see it as climbing a mountain or walking down a valley. Let's take the mountain example for a minute rather than the valley example. If you're climbing a mountain, how do you know that you're at the optimum? No higher point around you. Okay, there's no higher point around you. If you're climbing, in the, climbing down into the valley and you want to be at the bottom, the opposite applies. There's no point lower than the one that you're currently at. So that's one quick check for the optimum. You know that you're at the optimum when there's no point around you. Can you express that in terms of derivatives, what we've just learned about with Newton's method? How would you know that you're at the optimum? Okay, so when you're at the top of, yeah. sorry, yeah, when you're at the top of the mountain, the slope, gets the slope w let's say you're at the top. How do you know that you're at the top? What should the slope be? Flat. Flat. If you're right at the top of the mountain, it's flat, okay? So it, we saw that in one dimension, in two, in two dimensions that also applies. Three or more dimensions that applies we'll express that mathematically as follows, okay? That simply says the partial derivatives of f with respect to all the x's are zero, okay? Is what that says compactly. If this was a function of two variables, this expands and becomes df of x1, x2 with respect to x1 is equal to 0. A single equation, and it expands to a second equation, d of x1, x2, the partial with respect to the second variable. OK, 
Okay? So this is a compact way of saying, take the partial derivative of the objective function with respect to every one of your search variables. So two search variables in this case lands up with two equations. In that example of A, B, and C, you had three search variables, so you would get three equations. And they all have to be equal to zero? And set them equal to zero. The point where you set them equal to zero is your optimum. If you're at that optimum over here, the partial derivative with respect to the horizontal direction is zero, and the partial derivative with the vertical is zero. Because at the optimum, every point in every direction all around you has got to be, be lower than you. Okay? Can we have more than one optimum? We're, d we're going to look at cases with multiple optimum for now, but we're, we're assuming we're finding a single unique optimum. Okay, so you know that you're at the optimum when this criteria is met, and this is a necessary condition. Okay. That must, if that condition is not satisfied, you're not at the optimum. Okay? It's not a sufficient condition. We'll look at necessary and sufficient conditions later on. But at the very least, you do require that criteria to be met. Okay. So you can see how if this was, if you happen to have just a single search variable, here I've got two search variables, but if I only had one search variable, we've actually seen this before. It says the first derivative of f with respect to x is equal to zero. So the multivariate case always contains the single variable case inside it. So this is just taking it to a higher level here. Now I'd like you to look and try and answer the second question. And in fact, uh, Ashrad, you've answered it a little bit already. It says, if you're not at the optimum, how will you know where to go to get to it? Right? Or maybe, uh, let me maybe rephrase that a bit more as it sa says there. If you're not at the optimum, how will we know, yeah, how will we know where to go to get to the optimum? Okay, so, so I was saying you'll depends on where the gradient is positive or negative to tell you where to go. Okay. Kalia? I recall something with direction steep as the sun and going perpendicular. Okay. To the going perpendicular to the contours, going in the direction of steepest ascent or descent, depending on whether you're trying to maximize or minimize. Okay, so we'll write that again mathematically in a compact way as follows. It says that take a step of delta x equal to either the positive or negative gradient. Okay? And specifically, take a positive gradient step if you're trying to maximize. So if you're trying to maximize, you want to go up the direction of the gradient. If you're trying to minimize, you use the negative of it. So you can also see then Let's say you're at the optimum. What is this step size that you should take? Zero, right? If you're at the optimum already, this term over here, the, f the partial derivatives of f with respect to x, that is zero at the optimum. So it says take no further steps at the optimum. So as long as you're capable of taking a non-zero step, you're not at the optimum is what this equation is saying. So if you can take a non-zero step, 
along the gradient, the gradient is the direction of steepest ascent or steepest descent, then keep going. Now, what I want you to be very clear here is that delta x doesn't tell you where your next iteration is. It simply says, go in that direction. Right? It's a vector. Okay, so this is a vector, or specifically a direction vector. Okay. Now, I, I recognize this drawing might look a little bit wrong to you, that you, you're expecting the direction vector to point in this way. Um, the direction of steepest ascent is in this direction, delta x. I know it, it visually doesn't look like that, but on this bowl shape, this is the direction of steepest ascent. It's the, and the reason why it doesn't come out like that is because when you plot the stuff in computers, software, and if you distort your aspect ratio, it looks wrong. Okay, but this is the correct direction to go up, the steepest. So what delta x says, it simply says, go in that direction. It doesn't tell you how far to step. It just tells you where to go, in which direction. So let's visually look what happens. If we're at this location here, and I move along this, what is happening to my function values? And then? Right? What's happened over there? Decreasing. Sorry? Decreasing. decreasing. Still decreasing? I can't imagine. That's OK, so these are the contours. There's the minimum. So that's downhill. And we want to be in that downhill. So decreasing. we're decreasing. 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 Then it goes up again. Yeah. Right? So this is the, the valley. That's the very bottom of where you want to be. You're currently over here. You're sliding down, the, down it. But if you keep going, you're actually climbing back out, up, uphill again. OK, does everyone see that geometrically? So this direction vector, delta x, doesn't tell you to take a full step. right? It's back to this idea of Newton's method. Newton's method tells you to take a step of delta x, repeat. Step of delta x, repeat. Step of delta x, repeat. What we're recognizing here is that this is telling us the direction to go, but not how far to go in. And what we're going to do here now is we're going to have to figure out, well, should I take a unit step? Should I take two steps, three steps? Maybe I should take only a half a step or 1.5 of a step. How much of a step should I take before stopping? Can you change direction? Yeah. And that's so th what this is going to be our strategies. We're going to step, and we're going to try and find what we will call the optimal step. What is the best step to take? And then I'm going to recalculate my gradient. Because right? so, you can see that as I, let's say I'm at this point over here, the gradients are going to tell me to head in this direction. So you're going to step and find the best step size along that blue line, stop, recalculate the best gradient, and then repeat. Okay, So that's where we're going to head to next class. But what, what we, I'm hoping you see here is actually, remember I said right at the start of the course, the moment someone says best, it's an optimization problem. So I, I asked you to take the best step size. So we're actually going to make a mini optimization problem within this optimization problem. Okay? And we give that small optimization problem a new name. We call it line search. It says find the best step size along this line. Search along that line for the best step size to then recalculate your new gradient. So it's, nothing, it's the same like your GPS. You recalculate when you're at a new location. You recalculate to keep finding the optimum. Okay, so we're going to look at that then in the next class.